Uh, we're going to talk about another tool called FireSheep. Um, if you ever go to uh, DEF CON, one of the rooms you walk into is the Wall of Sheep. And they have all different types of tools that they use to detect who's got what turned on. So make sure before you go to a con like that, you read up how to harden your gear before you go so that you're safe. You don't use their wireless. Uh, you don't use wireless, period. Make sure you um, turn all that off, your Bluetooth, everything before you go in there, especially on your phones. Otherwise, as you walk by the room, they'll receive, uh, try to talk to your phone, and then you'll end up on the wall of sheep. It's not a fun thing. So that's the wall of sheep um, at a con. But this, we're going to talk about fire sheep. And what this is, is it's in a very similar sense. So it's a Firefox extension that uses a packet sniffer to intercept unencrypted cookies from websites, such as Facebook and Twitter. It facilitates, uh, facilitates discovery of identities and displays them in the sidebar. It allows the attacker to take over the identity of those persons in the sidebar, and it works. So there's a lot more you can do with FireSheet, but this is what you need to know about it for the test. So I uh, strongly recommend you play around with this, and we will have a lab on this as well. What's a DSLAM? Well, we talked about the public switch telephone network earlier, and a DSLAM is where you have a neighborhood. Let's say uh, you have one street that's a dead end, so it's a cul-de-sac, and you have four houses. So you have two houses, and let's say this is the end of the street, and the street comes up to here to a main road. <clears throat> so this, is, this one neighborhood is all connected to one DSLAM, okay? So we only have four houses in this neighborhood. So all of the wires go up the street and they go down the street and they go to some red brick building somewhere that the phone company owns and they get plugged in, they come up out of the ground and they get plugged into a D-SLAM. And what it is is basically a box with a bunch of phone jacks in it and then it kind of gaggles them together and translates all that into IP and sends it out of some other pipe on the other end. Whether it's a T1, a T2 or whatever they have configured in there, it could be optical gear, it could be anything at that point, but it gets translated into something else. And, um, the key note to a DSLAM architecture is that um, the lines are all separate all the way up to the DSLAM. They're all separated. So your bandwidth is only being consumed by you and your household. Whatever is going through your wireless and into your wire is only you. In the case of cable modems, it's one wire that goes up to the main office. So the CO, the central office. So everyone shares that same wire. So at 7 p.m., your internet, you might notice it gets slow. But that's because your whole neighborhood is sharing it with you. So if you're lucky and you only have a neighborhood with four people, it's not too bad. The cable companies try to be good about that, and they'll take everyone and kind of divide them up accordingly, but they're not always very good at it. And all it takes is a couple of kids that are downloading massive word lists to use against your wireless to eat up all the bandwidth that you have on your wire. So. That's kind of the difference between a DSLAM architecture and a cable modem architecture. So that's pretty much the big difference. Things can still slow down in a DSLAM architecture because as soon as you hit the DSLAM, that's where you're sharing data. You might have four DSLAMs in there, so all four neighborhoods connect at that point. But the difference is, is that in a cable modem environment, your traffic is shared with a bunch of other users. So there's different ways that I could maybe snoop on that traffic. There's different ways that I could send malware out and have it probe along the line and probe the other neighbor's houses besides using the wireless. And the DSLAM architecture, that doesn't happen until you hit the uh, DSLAM. So it's a lot harder to attack your neighbors that way. But there's different uh, things that they have protections in place to prevent that kind of thing. But every now and then it still happens. Some of those protections fail for whatever reason. Uh, you don't hear about it too much anymore. Uh, the gear's a little better, but there was a time when that was really popular to do. So we just discussed DSLAM architecture. Uh, we talked about cable modem architecture. The cable modem architecture, each neighborhood shares one single wire all the way back to the CO. And then when you get to CO, there's more and more sharing. So thin, uh, things team tend to really slow down in cable modem architecture um, because of the nature of the way the connections are. So at 7 p.m., you'll really notice it gets slow. In the DSLAM architecture, it's a little better. But it's not as fast as a cable modem. So the cable modems are still better all in all. And uh, now we're going to discuss uh, in-tier architecture. So in-tier, this is a test question. A term describing multi-level architecture systems. 
a term describing multi-level architecture system. So what is a multi-level architecture system? It's a group of servers, each with a unique role. That's what it is. It's a group of servers, each with a unique role. That's an interior architecture. So it includes security and depth architectures, for example, firewall on perimeter on the WAN egress point and restrictive firewall in front of a database inside. Remember how we talked about that earlier? You have a firewall, a web server, you have another firewall, and then the database. This firewall is not stateful between the database and the web server, but the one on the front in front of the web server is a stateful firewall. So stateful, remember, allows outgoing connections. It does not restrict them. Inbound connections are the only ones that are restricted. It can if you had special ACLs, but out of the box they're configured to let things go from the inside to the outside, the stateful component of those firewalls. Now we're going to discuss cryptographic software libraries. So SSL, Secure Socket Layer, and TLS, Transport Layer Security. The ports involved are 443, 25, 995, 21, 22, etc. Uh, we're also going to discuss some uh, components of X509 certificate validation. So you're going to see quite a few test questions around this. Um, SSL is now defunct. TLS is the only thing left, and there are several versions which we're going to discuss. And we're going to discuss a lot of problems and attacks that are possible within these. Certificate and public key pinning. What is that? Public key pinning involves one extra step over the normal X509 process. The extra step is to take a hash of the certificate when you first request one. So for the first time, when you go out, if you're going to pin certificates, when you go out to a website, say Home Depot again, so you go out to homedepot.com over the HTTPS, say you're shopping for something, so then um, you capture the certificate and you pin it. So what you've done is you've checked, you've taken the certificate, you pull a hash off of it, a SHA hash, right, because we don't use MD5 because it's insecure. So you take that hash and you store it. You've pinned it on your, so picture a little sticky and you put it on your bulletin board. Boom, here's my certificate, these numbers, blah, blah, blah. So the extra step is taken, uh, take a hash of the certificate and compare it against a list of known hashes of certificates. So each time you go out and collect the, the Home Depot certificate, you check it against the one that you've saved that you say is good. So the trick here is not to get tricked up front. If you get tricked up front, then it doesn't help you at all. So you just make sure that every time you check the certificate that it's the same one that you originally saw. So that's all it is. So again, it's not foolproof, but it's, if something gets hacked along the way, then it's better than nothing. So it pre uh, the idea is to prevent uh, being duped by a forged or stolen certificates. And they're used in hardened environments. So there's also a process called footprinting a server. So you can look at not only the certificate, but which ports are open and things of that nature. Um, Malware infected machines always have some kind of little giveaway that you can kind of footprint the machine so you know like if this uh, malware infected machine all of a sudden shows up on another machine you can have a good idea that it was moved or that it was uh, that machine is infected with the same malware depending on what you're looking at. So again metrics and fingerprinting footprinting. Certificate pinning is used in hardened environments. Uh, a lot of your phone apps will use this kind of thing to identify specific servers that are key in authentication or something like that. So you may only pin certi uh, certain servers, ones that you need to be able to trust, or one that you may have set up, or an app where you're saying you can only use my server, so you pin your certificate only, and you're only going to tr trust your server and no one else's. But you need to be sure that it's your server and you're not being faked out.